Let's begin with a word of prayer, okay? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. Lord, just it's amazing that every single dot and tittle, Lord, that you had written and recorded in your word is important. And Lord, it has significance in our lives, Lord. Lord, most importantly, we learn about you. We learn about your plans and your purposes and how you have that thread of redemption from Genesis all the way through Revelation, Lord. I pray now that you would fall afresh on us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, that, Lord, the ladies that are in this room, Lord, that your spirit would fill them up, that their ears would be anointed to hear what your spirit has to say to them, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, Lord, would be acceptable in your sight, that I would speak only those words that are pleasing to you. Lord, anything that's of me, Lord, I pray that you would just remove now. And that, Lord, though we can always have a good time with your word, Lord, we know that your word is truth and it's serious and it's something to um, really take to heart. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just minister to your women now, clarify any um, confusion that they might have, Lord, and Lord, if they still have confusion in the group, Lord, I just pray that their group leaders would just have wisdom from on high. Lord, thank you that your word tells us in James that if any of us lack wisdom, we can ask of God. And that goes for every single person that's a child of yours. We can ask of you because, Lord, you desire for us to be wise. So you give us wisdom abundantly and without reproach. We love you. We thank you for that. We ask you now just to... Bless this time and keep the distractions away. In Jesus' precious name, and everyone said, amen. amen. Well, if you guys want to open your Bibles up to chapter 10, we're going to dive right in. Feel free to dive right into that soup that smells delicious. I got to get that recipe. Oh, my goodness. But in chapter 10, we encounter another fun and exciting list of names, right? <laughs> when we come to genealogies, I have to admit that I'm so tempted to just kind of skim over them to see if I can find any names that might be applicable for some future grandchildren or whatever, right? <laughs> I mean, Shem has kind of a nice ring to it, doesn't it? And I was thinking, well, Shem's a nice name for a future grandchild. But then I learned that the name Shem actually means name in Hebrew. So if my Shem grows up and goes to Israel, then somebody asks him, what's your name in Hebrew? Then he says, my name is name. <laughs> And so then it becomes kind of like a, a who's on first bit. So if you're my age group, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. If you're not, look it up, okay? <laughs> then there's Nimrod. Well, even before I understood what a bad dude this guy was, the name Nimrod is just not a name that I'd want to call my grandchild from across a crowded room or the courtyard at church or whatever. It just doesn't have a nice sound to it, does it? It's like... Nimrod, come on, come on, we're going now. It just, it's like, oh, yeah, that one, we got to X that one. And it's a good thing because he's a bad guy too. But really when it comes down to lists of names in the Bible, sometimes it seems like God cares a lot more about those names than we do. Except, of course, if it's our own name, right? We're always looking for, it's kind of like the pictures, you know, the yearbook. You go and you, what do you do? You look for your picture first, you know? You want people to remember your name. If they don't remember your name, it's a little bit hurtful, you know? I always try to remember everybody's name and call them by their name because it, it's important to me. I know when I go to a restaurant and I, I notice the waiter or the waitress's names, I'll always try to call them, not... Excuse me, excuse me. I try to say Betty or George or whatever, you know, could you, you know, oh, thank you so much, George, or thank you so much, Betty, or whatever, because it builds an immediate rapport when we know somebody's name. Well, the fact of the matter is that God knows your name and he knows my name. And you know what? He knows if you're his child and he knows if you're his enemy. 
And at the last judgment, ladies, we're all going to realize how important it is that God keeps a list of names, especially the Lamb's Book of Life. You're going to want to make sure that your name's written there. Because if it's not, Revelation chapter 21 verse 8 tells us that everyone whose name is not written in the Lamb's Book of, the li of Life will find their place in the lake of fire. Yikes. In Genesis chapter 10, we have this list of names known as the table of nations. And God basically lists for us the good guys and the bad guys for our future reference. Here we learn that all the people who have lived on this planet ever since the flood of Noah's day are descendants of Noah and specifically of one of his sons, Shem, Ham, or Japheth. His chosen people, his enemies, or those who just might be grafted in as family. This list is the dispersion of Noah's descendants. And spoiler alert, this includes each one of us. So let's begin by reading in chapter 10, verse 1. These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the floods. This, the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magar, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tyrus. The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Rephaz, or Rip, Ripha, sorry, and Togarma. The sons of Java, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, Doadim, Doanim, sorry. And from these, the coastal land or the coastland people spread in their lands, each with his own language by their clans and in their nations. And you notice that after each group of the list of genealogies, you're going to notice that, that it says that these are each dispersed by their own language, by their clans, and in their nations. In James Boyce's commentary, he states, even the most hostile of critics are included to acknowledge um, are inclined to acknowledge this table's extraordinary importance of accuracy. William F. Albright wrote rather early in his career when, it was, um, when he was far from as conservative as he later became that the 10th chapter of Genesis stands absolutely alone in ancient literature without a remote parallel, even among the Greeks, where we find the closest approach to a distribution of peoples in genealogical framework. The table of nation remains an astonishingly, astonishingly accurate document. Wow. And you and I thought that this was just another boring list of names of people that we didn't know. No, ladies, this is our family. This chapter shows a general outline of how the people and nation of the nations of the world all generated from Noah's three sons after the flood. The truth of the matter is, ladies, there's only one race, and it's the human race. There are different ethnicities and ethnicities, but we all descended from Noah. We are all related. We were all created in the image and likeness of our God. And as believers in Jesus Christ, we are bound by his blood. And as they say, blood is thicker than water. Well, the blood of Jesus is thicker still. And it's no wonder that when we as believers go to different churches or different cities or different states or even different countries, and we meet other believers, there's an immediate connection to them because we're family, ladies. And our roots go deep. They go deep into the word of God. And guess what bumper sticker every single one of us could put on our car? My family survived the great flood, <laughs> right? <laughs> By the way, the next time that you have to fill out paperwork at a doctor's office or whatever, and it asks you your race, I challenge you to check the other box and then fill in the blank with human, okay? We're all the human race. The author of this portion of scripture records that the three sons of Noah will become the three great divisions of the new world. 
He also gives us the least information about Japheth, probably because he knew the least about this people group. After all, he would have wanted to warn the Israelites about the um, family of Ham because that family was the one from which the cursed son Canaan would come. And these would be the um, enemies of God's chosen people, the Israelites. Naturally, he would also want to give them as much information as he could about the line of Shem, from whom they had themselves originated and from whom the promised Messiah would eventually come. But he begins with the line of Japheth. Japheth was, as I understood it, as I read my scripture, the second son of Noah. But some commentators say that he was actually the first son of Noah. But whatever, we know that he was a son of Noah. He's listed last. But um, his descendants would be one of the two large divisions of the Gentile population, the non-Hebrew groups. The other, of course, would be the sons of Ham. You may have noticed when you colored in your map on your homework that Japheth's family landed in the northern region of the map known as the Indo-European area. Upon closer look at the names of Japheth's line, you may have noticed a few of the names that you recognized. Maybe you recognized Gomer's name. And if you're in my age group, I want you to get Gomer Pyle right out of your mind right now, okay? <laughs> I was thinking more about Gomer, who was the unfaithful wife of the prophet Hosea. But we need to think again, because the name Gomer, the first son of Japheth, refers to the people group who would eventually become the people of Germany. Next in the name, um, next is the name Magog. And if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you probably recognize this name from the book of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 38, we actually run into a whole list of the sons of Japheth and Ham here. I want you to see how many names you recognize as I read from um, Ezekiel chapter 38, beginning in verse 1. And this is what the Lord said to Ezekiel. Son of man, set your faith toward, face towards Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws and I will bring you out and all your horses and horsemen and all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords, Persia, Cush and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his hordes, Beth Togamar, from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes and many people are with you. Did you notice how many names, not just from Japheth's family, but from Ham's family as well? After this, the verses that follow explain what will be happening in the last days concerning all the nations that were first mentioned here in Genesis chapter 10. Every single dot and tittle. Every single word that God records for us has significance. So I want you to remember that the next time you come across a list of names in the Bible, because that list of names may be extremely important and may give you a clue into the last days. Look at the significance of these people in verse 18 of the same chapter in Ezekiel, it says in verse 18, but on that day, the day that Gog shall come against the land of Israel, declares the Lord God, my wrath will be roused in my anger. I will summon a sword against Gog on all my mountains, declares the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. So I will show my greatness and my holiness and make myself known in the eyes of many nations. And then they will know that I am the Lord. Ladies, in Genesis 10, we learn how the nations were first divided. And in the last days, we will see how God will use those same 
nations to show his greatness and his holiness to all the people of the world that they might know that our God is the Lord God. So back to Genesis chapter 10, verse 6, it says, The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, Put, and Canaan. Now I want you to remember that Ham's sons are notorious enemies of Israel. Verse 7, the sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, that's a pretty name though, <laughs> Havilah, so um, Sabta, Rama, and Sabateka, the sons of Ra- Rama or Rama, Sheba, and Dedan, Cush fathered Nimrod, there's that ugly name. Nimrod was the most notably evil offspring of Cush. His name means we shall rebel. He was the great grandson of Noah and was also the first on the earth to be called a mighty man, but not in a good way like we might be thinking. It says in verse nine, he was a hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Literally, ladies, he was an arrogant, defiant tyrant before the Lord. He wasn't a hunter like you and I think of a hunter that goes out, you know, chasing down deers for dinner or whatever. He was a hunter of men. He loved to go out murdering and conquering. And then it says in verse 10, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, which ladies later became Babylon, the archetype of pride, disobedience, and rebellion. Eric, Akkad, and Kala, or Kala, in the land of Shinar. And by the way, Shinar, they think, was probably the area where the Garden of Eden was. And so no wonder they wanted to end up settling there in Shinar. It would have been a beautiful plain. Verse 11 says, from that land, he went into Assyria and built Nineveh. Remember, this is, we're talking about Nimrod, Nimrod and what he built. And he built Assyria and he built Nineveh. These are two of the horrible, horrible cities that we read about in the Bible. Where have you heard about Nineveh before? Right, in the story of Jonah. And do you remember that Jonah didn't want to go to preach to them? Why? Because they were so evil that he didn't want them to repent. He wanted God's judgment to fall upon them. He ran in the opposite direction because he didn't want to have any part of seeing them get saved. Two of the cities established by Nimrod were two of the most wicked cities to ever exist. And yet God still had mercy at least on one of them. And that was um, Nineveh. Ladies, how like us, huh? When we hear about somebody evil, you know, we hear about the Jeffrey Dahmers of the world, or we hear about these horrible um, uh, people who go in and kill children, and we, we wish for them to be killed. We wish for them to reap God's judgment, and yet God still has mercy and grace available to them if they will call out to him. And you know, it's hard sometimes for me to imagine. It's like they need to burn in hell. Well, God knows better than we do, and thank God he's God, not me, because I would be the one that would be going, oh no, you're going to hell. (laughs) But um, let's go on. It says, the next one is Rebo, Bas, Ir, Kala, and in verse 12, Rezin between, uh, between Nineveh and Kala, and that is a great city. And then verse 13, Egypt fathered Ludim, Anamin, Lahabin. This is such a test for me. <laughs> Naphtahim, Pathrushim, and Kash Lahim from whom it tells us the Philistines Philistines came. And you guys know that also the notorious uh, giant Goliath came from the Philistines. So we see another really horrible enemy of the Israelites. And then there was Kaphtarim. If you hadn't already noticed, Ham's descendants look a whole lot like the A-list of major enemies of Israel. But wait, there is more. In verse 15, we finally get to Canaan, who was the cursed 
who was cursed by Noah. Did anyone else in this room wonder why Canaan was cursed and not Ham himself? After all, it was Ham who disrespected his father and exposed his father's sin instead of covering it up like Shem and Japheth did. Well, first of all, let me let you know that our God will never curse a believer. He had already blessed Shem, Ham, and Japheth because they were his children. No, they were Noah's children and he had blessed them. But they were also all true believers. Remember when Adam and Eve fell in the garden? God cursed the serpent for his part in tempting Eve to sin. But to Eve, he promised to multiply her pain in childbearing, but he didn't curse her. To Adam, he promised to curse the ground so that man had to really work to be able to provide the food for his family, but he didn't curse Adam. It seems that Noah had to look all the way down Ham's line to his youngest son before there was an unbeliever in the family to curse. Also, many commentators believe that Noah pronounced this judgment at the end of his life rather than immediately after the event occurred. So it's possible that when Noah cursed the, um, Canaan, he was cursing the nation of Canaan and not the person of Canaan, which seems to be evident in the fact that the whole nation became servants of the Israelites. And what a good reminder for us, ladies, that Love covers a multitude of sin. It doesn't expose it. By the way, that doesn't mean that we cover up sin. We know from Galatians chapter 1 that if we know a brother or a sister who is caught up in any transgression, it tells us that we who are spiritual are supposed to restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. Ladies, we have a responsibility to correct and seek to restore a fallen brother or sister, but we're to consider our own propensity towards sin so that we will be discreet and will be gentle. I always think of prayer as the anesthesia that we need to use before we go in with the scalpel of God's word to cut away the infection of sin in another believer's life. I'm sure that none of you would volunteer to have major surgery without any anesthesia. You know, I'm having brain surgery. Go ahead. I'm tough. Just go ahead and do the surgery. No, we all want that anesthesia. Put me out. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to know what's going on. In the same way, ladies, I pray that each and every one of us will remember before we go in, if we have to correct a brother or sister that's in sin, that we will pray, that we will administer a large dose of anesthesia before we go in with the scalpel of God's word. Galatians chapter 6, verse 3 through 4 continues. It says, For if anyone thinks that he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work and then um, his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. What this means is that when we confess our sins, as it tells us in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What God has forgiven, ladies, we have no right to bring back up. Don't use the sin of another to make yourself look better, which it seems is what may have been Saint, um, Ham's major sin that caused him to be cursed. Not only did he see the nakedness of his father, but he used it as an opportunity to look better to the rest of the family. Look, dad sinned. Ha, ha, ha. I didn't do this. You know, he's drunk over here. So he was mocking his father and he was usurping authority, which makes sense then that the curse would be that his son, his son's family line would be slaves because they were trying to usurp authority. So the very opposite of usurping authority is becoming a slave. And that's what we're all called to be. In a sense, we need to be bond servants of Jesus Christ, right? So it's not a curse that we are called 
to be servants of Jesus Christ. Um, Verse 15 continues. It says, Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, verse 16, and the Jebusites. Now, side note, ladies, the Jebusites lived in the most sacred city, Jerusalem, for many, many years, although they were the most wicked of Israel's enemies. The Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Arvadites, and the Zemarites, and the Hamathites, and the Parasites, too. But anyhow, this is Israel's most wanted list. These are Israel's worst enemies, and the list will be repeated 19 other times in the Old Testament. It goes on, it says, Afterward, the clans of the Canaanites dispersed in verse 19, and the territory of the Canaanites extended from Sidon in the direction of Gerar as far as Gaza. Where have we heard of Gaza recently? And in the direction of Sodom and Gomorrah, where have we heard of Sodom and Gomorrah? Two more very evil cities, Adma, Zeboim, As far as Lasha, verse 20, these are the sons of Ham by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. Now, in our homework, ladies, we studied an explicit list of behaviors that were never to be practiced because they were so, such wicked practices of these people in the lands. Leviticus 18 listed those sins for us, and I'm not even going to mention them here, but I will tell you that some that are mentioned are being celebrated in our country by the LGBTQ plus community and even by the general population in our colleges and our universities today. Finally, we get to the godly line of Seth in verse 21. It says to Shem, I'm sorry, I said Seth, I meant Shem. To Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber. Now, from Eber, we get the root word for for Hebrews. So Moses was pointing out to us that all the children of Eber are children of Israel or they're Hebrews, okay? To Shem, the elder brother of Japheth. That's why I think that Japheth was younger than Shem, but... Others say that it's supposed to be written differently. But nevertheless, to Shem, the elder brother of Japheth, children were born. Verse 22, the sons of Shem, Elam, Asher, Arpashan, Led, and Aram, the sons of Aram. And from from the sons of Abraham came the Armenians or the Cyrians. And we remember those again. The Syrians show up in in the Old Testament often. Sometimes they're actually supportive of Israel. So, um, Uz, Hull, Jether, and Mash are um, Arpashan fathered Shelah. Shelah fathered Eber. To Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. Now, this is just a time reference for us, ladies, to remember what's coming up. What's coming up? The story of the Tower of Babel. So he says, when Peleg was born, that's when the Tower of Babel occurred, okay? So then it goes on. It says, his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan fathered Almadad, Shalef, Hazermoth. See, this is such a test for me. Hazermoth, Jerah. Hadaram, Uzal, Dikla, Obel, Abimiel, Sheba. Now, you may recognize this name because the most famous of the line of Sheba was the Queen of Sheba. Remember that? And she came to King Solomon, remember? And, she, and Solomon showed her all that she had. She said, I heard of your wisdom, but I, I didn't even hear the half of it. This is amazing. She was a wonderful woman. Um, verse 29 goes on, Ophir, Havilah, and Jobah. Now, these are some names you can name your kids or your grandkids, okay? Those, these are great names. All of these were the son of, sons of Joktan who settled in the Middle East, So these are all the Israelites here. Verse 30, the territory in which they lived extended from Mesha in the direction of Sephar 
to the hill country of the east. And these are the sons of Shem by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. Verse 32, these are the clans of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies in their nations. And from these nations um, spread abroad on the earth after the flood. Now, the, this is a list of 70 names in the table of nations, and it signifies completeness, but not that Moses gives us the name of every child that was born to, no, or, yeah, to Noah and his family, but rather that all the nations are accounted for, okay? So the fact that there's 70 names here shows us it, it's a reminder of completeness. Remember that we learned that seven is a number of completeness, 10 is also a number of completeness, and then you multiply them together and you get the number 70. So again, we get completeness. Then it's, uh, Canaan was cursed, and yet for hundreds of years, this nation lived in what would be known as the promised land. But when Joshua led the children of Israel into the promised land, the curse of Noah was fulfilled, and the Canaanites became servants to God's chosen people. Blessed be the God of Shem, the godly line, the line of promise, the Hebrew people. Some of you have, may have heard years and years ago, and I hate to even bring this up, but I'm going to bring it up. But years and years ago, somebody decided that the curse of Ham meant because a lot of Ham's uh, relatives ended up in the region of Africa, that it was all black people. And that's why it was okay to have anybody with black skin as a slave. And that only proves the sin of even those commentators because the curse was to only Canaan's family. Canaan's family ended up in the promised land. They weren't even close to um, Africa. So they would not have had black skin. So that is so off base. So just to clarify that for all of you who've ever heard that crazy thing going on, I think the Ku Klux Klan was the one who really got that going. And uh, anyhow, that's a big old fat lie from the pit of hell. So before we get to the Tower of Babel in chapter 11, let me point out one more thing about Noah, son Japheth. Remember in chapter 9 that Noah said this, May God enlarge Japheth, let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servants. Though Japheth was not to be the appointed line of the Messiah who would come, nevertheless, his descendants would be given the opportunity to be treated as family the sons of Japheth eventually filled up most of the territory on earth. As, but as Jesus said in Mark 8, verse 36, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Yet for any of us who choose to say yes to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, we are grafted into the family of Shem. Who are these people who are welcomed and treated as family? Ladies, this is us. God includes us. Those who were afar off are brought near. Now let's turn to chapter 11 and the story of the Tower of Babel. As we come to chapter 11, some of you may have been confused since we just learned that the nations were divided by the people groups according to their language, to the languages they spoke. And this is true. But then it says in verse 1, now the whole earth had one language and the same words. Well, understand, ladies, that the Bible is often not written in chronological order. And that is absolutely the case here. In chapter 10, Moses, the author of Genesis, gives us the generations of Noah's son, and he explains where each family settles. And now, in a sense, he kind of says to us, well, let me back up a bit and fill you on, on how rebellious this people, they, these people were. And he says, they didn't want to go anywhere, but God in his sovereignty and in his will will always accomplish his purpose. And so he begins chapter 11 with these words. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. 
And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. Like I said before, this is many commentators believe that Shinar was the area of the Garden of Eden, and so it would have been a very beautiful plain. And so they're like, hey, we're not going anywhere, you know, we just want to stay here. And it may seem to many that the Lord is being rather harsh in his dealings with these people who only wanted to stay in a beautiful place with their family. Who doesn't kind of want to stay with their family, right? But nothing could be further from the truth. Understand that only about a hundred years had passed since Noah and his family had emerged from the ark into this whole new world. But as we saw last week, though sinful humanity had been eradicated from the face of the earth, sin still lived in the heart of even the best of men. Noah himself, the one that God had found grace or had found grace in the eyes of the Lord before the flood became drunk with wine and he behaved in a very ungodly manner. And remember also that after the flood, Noah lived 350 more years. So he still would have been alive when to witness the rebellion that brought about the Tower of Babel. Can you imagine seeing your own grandchildren? You you are like, we told you what happened before. Praise God, Noah had the promise that God said, I will never again flood the earth to destroy man. But he had to be just shaking his head, just seeing that his own relatives had fallen so far. Noah himself was... um, a very godly man, and yet he sinned. Remember also that the the rebellion that began, the brainchild of the Tower of Babel was none other than that tyrant named Nimrod, whose very name meant what? We shall rebel. By the time Nimrod decided to build this city and this tower and this name for himself, sin was rampant once again. The people of the new world were just as sinful as the people just prior to the great flood. They had left the God of their fathers for false gods, and they were seeped in idolatry and polytheism. God would have been completely justified if he had decided to once again wipe them off the face of the earth. But faithful to his promise, his grace abounded. Instead of destroying this rebellious people, he dispersed them by confusing their language. In chapter 9, verse 1, Noah and his family first stepped foot on dry ground and the Lord commanded them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. But the people decided, according to verse 2 of this chapter, that they weren't going to do that. Instead, they had found a beautiful plain and they were going to settle there. We began to understand the depth of their rebellion when we read the language that mimics the language of our great God as he counseled together with the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as they created man. Remember, he said, come, let us make man in our own image. And what did they say in verse 3? They said to one another, (laughs) that's okay. They said, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and well, it's tar. That word is tar, okay? For motor, motar. Um, then they said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower with a top in, its heav- in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. They were so determined to do what they wanted to do that they were willing to go to all the trouble to make bricks when they couldn't find stone there. They didn't even care that it was hard work to rebel against God. They just wanted to do what they wanted to do. And isn't that just how the enemy works, ladies? Sin takes so much effort. You you know, you lie, 
and you because you want to make yourself look a little bit better than you really are. And then you have to remember the lie that you told to someone. And then you have to remember the lie that you had to tell to cover up this lie and that lie and so on and so forth because you don't want to get found out. But then one lie becomes another and another and another. And as Sir Walter Scott so famously said, oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Another very wise man, my husband, Dennis Davenport, has often said, sin makes you stupid. (laughs) Why? Because it takes you farther than you wanted to go. It keeps you longer than you wanted to stay. And it costs you more than you ever thought you would have to pay. These people were so sin stupid that they wanted to, number one, put down roots against God's will by building a city. Number two, they wanted to ascend to the heavens by building a tower, creating their own brand of religion. And number three, to bring glory to themselves by making a name or a shem for themselves. Building a city wasn't the problem in and of itself, ladies. It was that God said, go, but they said, no. This is a picture of self-sufficiency. And that's where Satan gets all of us. We all want to do it ourselves. You know, it starts when we're babies, isn't it? I can do it. I'll never forget when Jacqueline's youngest, Finley, was about probably 18 months old, and I took her to the country club one time, and I took the, all the kids swimming, and um, I was putting on her little floaties, and she's like, no, Nana, I can do it. I can do it, and I go, oh, you can, huh? And I was a lifeguard when I was a kid, and so they always said, you know what? Just let them see that they can't do it, and then they'll, you know, let you help them and stuff, and so I said, go right ahead, and so she goes in, and she's under the water, you know, blah, 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 blah. and so I pick her up, and she goes, I got this, Nana, I got this. I'm like, oh my goodness, she still didn't see her need for help. How often do you and I do the same thing? God speaks to us through his word, and we refuse to obey, thinking that we are the exception to the rule. As the old saying goes, if you say go, I will go. If you say stay, I will stay. Ladies, self-sufficiency is the enemy's tool. Jesus said, um, or tells us in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. Building a tower wasn't the problem. It was their desire to glorify themselves rather than glorify God that was the problem. It reminds me of someone else in scripture who wanted to ascend the heavens. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13, speaking of Lucifer, that angel of light who wanted to become not just like God, but God himself, it says, you have said in your heart, I will descend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. But then it tells us in the very next verse, but you are brought down to Sheol to the far reaches of the pit. We no longer know Lucifer as the angel of light, but rather Satan, the great deceiver. As I said before, sin makes you stupid. And the people decided to build a tower, or better yet, it was called a ziggurat, which looked a whole lot like a pyramid, but it had stairs up to the top. I'm sure they were completely amazed at their incredible building abilities as they stood back and they admired their stairway to heaven. But guess what? According to verse 5, God still had to come down to see their work. You see, we know now, since we've put men on the moon, how ridiculous it was for them to think that they could build a tower whose top would reach the heavens. Even the tallest buildings on earth cannot be seen from outer space. Yet, haven't we all at some time or another attempted to showcase our own great ability at this thing or at that, only to find out how very limited our abilities really are? 
God warns us in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. He also warns us in Isaiah 42, verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I will not share with another, neither my praise to graven images. Every time we start our day without prayer, ladies, without seeking God's wisdom and guidance for where we should go, what we should say, what we should do, we're showing our self-sufficiency and we're robbing God of the glory that's due to his name. God is so gracious. In verse six, he says, behold, they are one people and they all have one language and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they purpose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. Now, I want you to understand, you know, linguists um, with the whole evolution theory and all that, they believe that languages evolved. But we know from the word of God that it was an instantaneous miracle. And just like God created Adam and Eve as mature human beings, man, male and female, completely ready to have children, he instantaneously created various languages that were mature. They didn't grunt. They didn't try to, oh, you know, they didn't do that. They immediately could speak in the various languages. But can you imagine how crazy it would have been when they suddenly realized that they couldn't speak to the person next to them, that they spoke a different language. They had to go find somebody from their immediate family in order to be able to communicate. And then it tells us that God, it goes on, let's see, where was I? It says, oh, and then I love the fact that, you know, it says that God then made them disperse. Well, just because they had various languages, they might have still hung out there. Well, we really like this area. But God said, no, you will go. And so they ended up, go, okay, I have to go find my family and they're way over there. And I got to go find my family and they're way over there. And they just kept moving further and further. And so God's purpose is always accomplished. God loves unity, ladies, but not when men unify to sin successfully. In the garden, Eve's sin was pretty clumsy, wasn't it? It wasn't thought out. She just sort of fell into sin because she was deceived by the serpent. And then she got Adam involved. Now, Adam knew better, but it appears that he loved Eve more than he loved God. And so he chose to sin along with her. But by the time the people arrived in Babylon, they had become very sophisticated in their sin. They began to cooperate together to rebel against God. They had become like an organized crime group. God knew that together they would never turn back to him. But by confusing their language, we see God's abundant grace as all of us are more likely to turn to God when we feel alone. Isn't that true? When we're lonely and we, we don't feel like we have a friend on this earth, we cry out, Lord, you alone have the words of everlasting life. And so the Lord's will was accomplished as it always is because he is our sovereign God. The nations were dispersed as God originally planned. Verse 8 says, So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of the whole earth. We know that Babel was the tower itself. But the area ended up being called Babylon. And we know that Babylon shows up again in the book of Revelation. What lesson for us today can we learn? Well, God's will will always be accomplished in our lives with or without our cooperation. Unfortunately, as we learned in today's study, some people have to learn the hard way. I hope you're not one of them. If you choose to sin, you choose to suffer. 
God will take you to the mat, ladies. And believe me, you're going to lose against him every single time. How much better to be on the winning side to begin with. And I'm not going to finish um, reading the whole chapter, but I do want to point out a little play on words from verse 4. Remember I told you that the name Shem means name in Hebrew? Well, these ungodly people wanted to make a name for themselves. They wanted to make a Shem for themselves. And guess what? They were looking and they're like, well, God bless Shem. We're going to make a Shem for ourselves. We're going to bless ourselves. But God used the line of Shem to make his name known to all the earth. The chosen people, the Shemites, were not only chosen by God to be his people, but they were chosen by God to be his witnesses, to proclaim the good news to this lost and dying world. And guess what, ladies? You and I have been grafted into the family tree of Shem, and we are called to glorify God and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to this lost and dying world. The rest of the chapter reiterates the genealogy of Shem, but it goes on in verse 26, and we read, When Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And thus we come to Abram, whom soon we're going to get to know as Father Abraham, who had many sons, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord, okay? God bless you guys. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your word that is so true and relevant. And Lord, we just see the prophecies coming to fulfillment. We see Gaza, what's going on over there in the Gaza Strip. We pray for the innocent people there, but we also pray for Israel. Lord, we know that you have your hand on that people and on that land, and you gave them that land. And so, Lord, we pray that you will be with Israel, that you will strengthen them, that you will protect them. And Lord, we pray for Hamas. Lord, we pray that they, many of them might come to you. Lord, I, I heard recently of a son of a Hamas leader who turned to you. And God, we pray that you, by your Holy Spirit, might do that mighty work. Thank you for these ladies. Let them be excited that, Lord, you saw them way back in Genesis chapter 10. And even before that, Lord, you knew how many hairs would be on their head and you know their name. Lord, I pray that every lady in this room's name is written in your book of life. And Lord, thank you that your word tells us that you who've begun a good work in us is faithful to complete it. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. God bless you guys.